um, or any questions for Marianne in general, um, join us back in in um, in half an hour. So um, I get to introduce myself next, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to get my presentation up and, and ready to share. Um, thanks so much, Marianne, for giving that to us in French. It's always um, interesting for me. I'm still learning French, so <laughs> I get to watch um, you present and I hope someday I'll be able to understand more of that. Um, so uh, I'm just getting my presentation up on the screen. Thanks very much, Louis, for sorting that out. Um, OK, so I am giving a presentation today. I have given a few presentations lately about the Great River Report, and all the other presentations I've given have been about um, the science of the Great River Report. And Marianne's just done a great recap of um, the project so far, and I get to have a little bit of fun today because it's community day. So today I'm going to be telling some stories about the project and about the people in the project rather than focusing on the science and the indicators. So um, I, uh, I moved to this area three years ago. I want to give a little story about how I got here. So I was living in Vancouver at the time, 2005, and I met David Magahi, who became my husband subsequently. He's originally from Cornwall, and we were both living and working in, in Vancouver at the time, and we had some opportunities to uh, move for work reasons. So we went to live in, in Europe for three years. I had a position with the European Commission, um, working as a biologist there. As a, I had a, a postdoctoral position. And then Dave got a, a job offer in California. And so we spent three years after that in California. And we were heading back to, to Canada. And we initially picked Vancouver to live. And um, we were looking for somewhere to stay in Vancouver. and. Um, we wanted to find somewhere just out of town and somewhere that would be quieter. And over the previous eight years, we'd been coming to Cornwall in the summer just for a week um, to spend the week with family. And so um, we came again that year to Cornwall and we stayed with um, Dave's sister and, and family. And of course, his dad also lives here in Cornwall. And um, I started asking Dave, well, why, why don't we return to Cornwall? You know, it looks like it got, has so much to offer. And I really think part of the draw was was the, the St. Lawrence River. And so we, we moved that year. Um, we had um, baby number two on the way. So we moved to, to Cornwall, Ontario, actually just outside Cornwall. And um, we have a place that's close to the Quebec border. Um, and it was a few months it took us to get settled in, and I was interested in, in finding some work. And my sister-in-law had mentioned to me that there was a River Institute here in Cornwall. And so two and a half years ago, I I went onto the website for the River Institute and I found that they were hosting a symposium. So we do full circle with me presenting here today. Um, I attended the 2018 symposium with my resume in my back pocket and I introduced myself um, actually initially to Robin Poole, who was uh, at the booth for the Conservatives. So I'll do a little shout out now for Robin. He's at the booth again today. So if you go onto our website and you go and look at the online booths, you'll, you'll find Robin there. And Robin introduced me to Brian Hickey, and then finally I did meet Jeff Riddle. And a few weeks later, um, I took on a position here at the River Institute. And Jeff asked me to work on this ecosystem health report. So the health report was something that Jeff had envisioned um, well before I arrived. And in fact, there was a committee already existing when I arrived at the R River Institute. And the point of doing the ecosystem health report was to communicate um, the health of the Upper St. Lawrence River to the community. When I was um, brought in on the project, it had already been um, framed in the Hinton Galawadakwa, so that's the Thanksgiving address. And the person who had suggested that it get framed this way is Henry Lickers. And for those of you who know Henry, he's an inspiration to many people, and I was really fortunate to meet him early on. So. Some of my concerns when Jeff told me that the project was uh, framed this way, I was concerned about um, cultural appropriation and the committee assured me that we had a strong partnership with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. And I was to find that out um, soon after when I got to meet Henry Lickers and Peggy Pike Thompson. Um, and in fact, the first time I met both of them, they spent four hours with me and so began my education um, about the Mohawk Nation and uh, and about their environmental philosophies. I'm really grateful to both of them 
for that initial meeting and then also for the support ever since. Um, it's been really, really great. Um, I was teaching at the college at the time as well. Um, part of the job at the River Institute was to be a professor at the college and I was teaching biology one to the environmental tech students. And through that, I got to meet Megan Mitchell, who subsequently came to join us on the project and has been working with us for over a year now. So Megan's been working in the Aquasasne community finding out what the concerns are of the people and what information they'd like to know and also some information that they're willing to share. And then just over a year ago, Abram Francis joined MCA um, and he's been amazing to the project. He's contributing um, the written documentation for the indigenous knowledge and um, bringing it into context for the for the Akwesosne uh, community. There are of course many others at MCA who I am we are also indebted to for this project. Um, and I think that the partnership with MCA really helps to make the project stand out. We have a big team at the River Institute. Um, there's uh, many people working on the project. They are not all focused only on the project, but we draw on most of the people at the River Institute for their expertise to help us with the project. Um, and we're really grateful for that. We also have some amazing volunteers who have brought their expertise in, um, particularly since COVID has um, been with us since March. We've had some people st step in and volunteer from us from, from other places in the world. One to note is Sylvia Rodriguez, who's actually volunteering for this project all the way from Guadalajara in Mexico. Um, so we're grateful for that. Um, we've also had um, Matt Watson and Amanda Nurse volunteering here um, uh, over the last eight months. So we're really lucky to have these people on the project. I want to have a sh uh, give a shout out to Karen Cooper. Um, Karen was the outreach and communications person here at the River Institute when I started, and really she was instrumental to helping me get acquainted with everyone here in Cornwall, with the community in particular. She introduced me to the Great River Network and all the people associated with that. She also um, took me under her wing and took me off um, across to the States um, to uh, attend some meetings with the St. Regis Mohawk tribe where I got to meet some some really great people and also have a, a good understanding of you know the, the issues around the river, the science that's happening on the river and, and meet people who have gone on to contribute a lot to this particular project. So just a moment to acknowledge the Thanksgiving address. So the Ohunt and Galawadakwa that we're framing the, the Great River Report in. Um, it's um, the Thanksgiving address is something that the Haudenosaunee people begin their important meetings with. So um, they go through acknowledging all of the levels of nature at the start of any important gathering. And it's to remind all of us how we are connected. And so framing this project this way, I think also reminds all of us that we are connected to the river and how our own health is intrinsically linked to the health of the river. Um, and so we're, we have the Thanksgiving address as the framework. We're working on developing indicators from um, the science point of view, and then we're, we're aiming to bring this all together with stories from the public. And I will be talking a little bit more about that now. Another important component um, with the, um, our uh, interaction with, with MCA and the indigenous um, Con content within the project is that we have Victoria Ransom who's contributing artwork and we're so grateful for the work she's doing. Um, she's developing unique artworks for for the project for each of the levels of the Thanksgiving address and um, all of these diagrams have, of course, imp importance for whatever the indicator is that they have centered on, but also all of the basket weaving has meaning as well as um, the, the choice around the plants and, and the animals that are involved in each of those intricate drawings. So we're really grateful to Victoria for her, um, for coming on board with this project. Um, I'm going to run through a few slides just to recap on the science. So um, we wanted to develop indicators on the river and we wanted to know what the public was concerned about. And so we wanted the indicators to address the public's concern. And I've shown this um, diagram a few times. It's a, a pie chart and it's showing the concerns of the community. This is the results of 420 people filling in our online survey. And every time I show this, I always point out that it's it's really interesting to see that we have all of these um, 
um, different elements selected. So people, when they've gone onto the website and told us what they're concerned about, they not only click on fish um, and, and water levels and water quality and things that we know are, are in the front of our minds, but they're, they're clicking on everything. So they're concerned about the sediment, they're concerned about the insects and the plants. They're concerned about everything. Um, and I, I feel like that really shows how connected they are to the river, understanding that everything is, of course, important. So after we had the concerns of the community, we brought scientists together. This is a year ago. Um, and we it was actually at, at the symposium, the river symposium a year ago. And we said to them, we've got the Thanksgiving address that we're framing this project in. Here are the concerns that the public are worried about. Can we please choose indicators that are relevant for the specifically for the Upper St. Lawrence River? And um, can you identify all those that you, that you would like to nominate that would address um, these concerns? And we came away from that workshop with a list of 90 indicators. We then went through a process of um, selecting the indicators, which involved developing some questions and sending those questions out to scientists that specialized in each of those areas. We had 21 um, scientists review the indicators for us, and we ended up with a, with a list of graded indicators. Um, and initially we picked uh, 25 indicators to start with as a final suite, and then we had discussions with our committee and also with the Mohawk Council at Krasasti, and we've now got 36 indicators. So the slide here shows the 36 indicators. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, and I don't expect you to be able to read everything in, in the buttons. But just so that you can see, we have three indicators for water. We have some for, well, three for land, two for plants. We have birds, wildlife, fish, and then we have um, threats. And in the threats are some of the indicators that of course fall within those groups as well. So we have some invasive species like the round goby and the phragmites. We also have an indicator on the number of um, invasive species. We have at the top there, there's six um, contaminant indicators. So we're looking at contaminants in the sediments, in the invertebrates, and then all the way up to the her herring gulls. So it's just to give you an idea of the breadth of the, the indicators that we're collecting. We have been working since April on getting the data behind these indicators. And for those of you that watched Marianne's presentation, you will have seen some of the progress we've made with those indicators. But today I want really to focus on some of the stories and the people um, that I've met um, and the other members of the, the team have, have met and interacted with through this process. So this next slide is um, focusing in on water. You can see the three indicators, water temperature, water levels and nutrients. And you can see some of the threats, so shoreline hardening, agricultural practices and runoff, and then also climate change. And so we have a group of scientists that are working on these indicators, and we also have community members that we associate with these indicators and collaborators. And so the community members that I, we've listed in this particular slide um, starts with Ron McDonald, and that's who the photo is of. And um, Ron is a diver um, in, in the area. Um, the other people listed are all actually also scuba divers. Um, they all have stories to tell. Um, today I'm going to focus on Ron. I, um, I met my husband through playing underwater hockey all those years ago in Vancouver, but in fact my husband had played underwater hockey with Ron McDonald many years um, previously. And Ron um, has been a scuba diver for 60 years. Ron is uh, 81 years old and he had uh, had a discussion with me a year ago talking about the water clarity in the river. And I realized that in his stories and in his observations, um, we could link those to many of the indicators. So for instance, with water clarity, that's of course related to agricultural practices and how many nutrients are coming in off the farmlands. And it's related to invasive species like the, the mussels and how much the mussels clean out of the water, um, you know, how much they filter out of the water changes the water clarity. And, and we have a, a more recent invasive in the round goby fish, which of course is now consuming the mussels. And again, we have some changes that we see in the water clarity. So just the observations that people like Ron McDonald make um, as a community member and his stories about the changes he's seen. And then we're working together to take the indicators that have been selected and, and bring them into a context that, that the 
the community members can appreciate. Um, I'll also um, mention here Kat Kavanagh of Water Rangers. We're, we're going to be using her water testing kits for part of our outreach for the community. And um, Kat is also available in the booths right now if anyone wants to, to get online and talk to her. Um, we also have a partnership with the Great River Network. They're an amazing group of people here in Cornwall and they lead the, the river cleanup as well as doing many other um, things in this in this area. Um, so the, the framework for the project is that we are trying to take these scientific indicators and speak to members of the community so that the, the indicators are relevant for the community members. So the next few pictures are of Ron. When I spoke to him recently, I said, um, we have Stephanie Hildebrand. She's doing the visuals for us for the project and we'd really like to capture your story and pictures. And I said, you know, is there a chance I can join you for a dive? When next will you be going diving? And he said, oh, Lee, I'm going today. I'm going the next day. I'll be going every day all week, actually. And so that week I joined him for a dive and Stephanie came to take pictures of Ron. And uh, in fact, it was his 101st dive for the season on the day we went to meet with him, and that was just in September. So um, Ron, as I said, has been diving all his life and uh, he has much to share and, and a great love, of course, for the river. Um, for land, uh, there's an image here of Robin Poole. I mentioned the first time I came to, to introduce myself to the River Institute at the River Symposium. Robin was the first person I met. Robin is a um, is a, a key member of the community here. He's um, he's chaired the um, conservative the Cooper Marsh Conservancy's um, group for a long time, and he's worked closely with um, Raisin Region Conservation Authority in helping to raise funds for rehabilitation and restoration of Cooper's Marsh, um, and. I also want to mention Brendan Jacobs. So you can see for these land indicators, we have riparian habitat, wetland cover and forest cover. And these are actually indicators that um, RRCA already collects um, this information for um, the river and for their um, for the tributaries that run into the into the St. Lawrence River in their region. And so we've been having discussions with with um, Brendan about these indicators, how best to calculate them. And of course, um, we've we've also requested that they share their data with this project so that we can um, get some headway and in, in getting the results out for these kind of indicators. So um, I'm just touching on some of these. There's of course many more people, there are more scientists and more collaborators that, that will be involved in the project. But for now, we're just giving you a summary of, of um, who we have. Um, for the plants, we have Marianne working on, on the indicators for us. She's working on the land cover ones, she's working on the um, plants, and she's also working on the invertebrates. Um, and we have a, a group of community members that we want to mention today. Um, and they include Nancy Hildebrand, Jessica Shenandoah, Louise Ingle, Eddie Gray, and Vicky Horn. Um, and um, they're all they're all foragers, and, and we have some pictures to share with you. But before I go on to the pictures, I'll just also mention Barbara King, who has Watersheds Canada, um, which is a nonprofit that is helping people take action to change their shorelines and to soften them and um, make them better for for for, for the wildlife. Um, so. The indicators that are listed there, riparian habitat, wetland cover, forest cover, and typha, those are um, important uh, plant groups. And then, of course, we have threats as well that are um, impacting um, the plant, the plants in the area. Nancy Hildebrand is Stephanie Hildebrand's mom, and I had the privilege of going to her house on one occasion, and it was just so wonderful to be there. Um, Nancy is a forager. She collects a lot of the food that she eats um, from, from nature, and uh, the images here show her collecting cattails. She actually uses the, the pollen from the cattails um, in a bread that she makes, and again, you can see those images showing you um, her using those cattails. Um, it's of course she forages for many things and along with um, being able to use these things she ends up um, confronting some some issues that we also are, are trying to raise through these community stories. She's been foraging in, in a particular area for instance for dandelion roots um, and then has been told uh, while collecting that this particular area you can't collect from because they've been using herbicides. So it just brings up the concerns that we have as well around um, potential co contaminants in areas. Um, 
Stephanie and I had started to document these stories in the community, and um, we also both know uh, Jessica Shenandoah, who um, works in the summertime for the Mohawk Council of Aquasosne. She runs the cultural awareness camp on Thompson Island. We were really fortunate to have a day with her last summer. Um, and so we reached out to Jessica and she offered to, to join us. Um, in fact, I missed out on that opportunity, but uh, Stephanie and her mom went with Jessica and Jessica brought um, other members of the community from, from Aquasosne. Um, and they had a, a morning with with Stephanie's mum. They went into a local forest here in Cornwall and did some um, collecting um, of plants. In fact, the plants, of course, for food, but also for medicines, um, which are really important. And in fact, this forest that they went collecting in is now um, earmarked for development. And so, again, along with appreciating the nature and all of us getting out into it and, and really um, learning from people that are connected in a way where they're, they're foraging for their food, we also understand that, you know, there's when I think of um, losing habitat, I think of rainforests somewhere far away, you know, in, in Brazil or something that are being uh, taken down. But but really, we have these concerns uh, right here as well. And of course, development happens and we just hope that it gets, you know, everything gets done in a way um, that we can still keep and preserve areas like this where people can go and access food um, from, the, from, from nature. Um, so invertebrates uh, mentioned here, Marianne's doing the invertebrate indicators. Um, we had a wonderful email that came in via Jeff uh, Rydell where Christina Enright was concerned about um, the plight of the monarchs. So I'll, I'll show you some stories, that's, um, some photographs that Stephanie captured of that story. But before I go on to the next slide to show you that, I just want to um, give a shout out to Catherine Piquette. She's talking tomorrow in the Science Day. Um, she's from WWF. I know Marianne mentioned the, the watershed reports that um, WWF has produced. And in fact, there, there's a new release that's out this year on an updated version of those reports. And Catherine will be sharing that tomorrow. Um, she also has been great because we share an indicator with these um, with the benthic invertebrate data. And so she's shared the data from WWF with us from the cabin data set. And her and Marianne have worked a little bit together um, sharing our code to process those indicators and, and also the data. So um, Christina Enright um, has been concerned about the monarchs. Um, she, um, monarchs, of course, have a single food source in the milkweed and, and it's toxic to people. And so, of course, we want to keep it out of the farmland. So you end up getting milkweed along the roadsides and, uh, of course, the roadsides often get cleared. And so she had, um, she has a, has now has a rescue program where she tries to collect um, monarchs if she knows an area is going to be cleared. And so in her home, she has um, a refuge for them. And it's these people, you know, people like uh, her that are um, reminding us of how important it is to take note of nature and, and to take care of it. And again, these photos are uh, taken by Stephanie Hildebrand. So I'm on to fish. Um, of course, with fish, we have a lot of indicators. We have seven indicators that relate to the populations of the fish. And whenever I get to the fish, I also want to point out that it's not only the people that have stories, but the fish have amazing stories too. Um, I'm not sure that everyone's aware that the eel does a, does a massive migration from the St. Lawrence River all the way down um, to Florida, to the Sargasso Sea, and reproduces there. And then the young have to make their journey all the way back up into the St. Lawrence River. and they. They live up here until you know 25 years of age. So it's not just the people that have the stories, although today that is what I'm focusing on. We have scientists that have been working on the fish indicators. A shout out to Jacqueline Francesini. She's done a great amount of work on getting us to a point where we've got drafts of um, four of the fish indicators. Megan um, and Amanda Nurse, Megan Mitchell and Amanda Nurse have also been working on the indicators, particularly on the sturgeon. So we've had you know, people making progress on the indicators and we have, of course, many, many community members that have stories to share about their fish. And so I'll just run through a couple of those, starting with Mackenzie Petrie. I don't know if Mackenzie knows I'm presenting him today. He's a, a neighbor. He just lives two doors down. Um, it's been really amazing for me to land in such a wonderful community. Um, everyone around us is connected in some way to the river and has stories to tell. Uh, Mackenzie's uh, pretty special in that he's out on that river, I think, every day, uh, rain or shine. He's out um, fishing and hunting 
and even when it's iced over, he's still out, out um, on the river. And so I guess he represents this new generation of rivermen. I know there have been many generations of rivermen um, and they've been captured in some of the books and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, but yeah, these pictures, are, Stephanie spent the day with Mackenzie and she was able to document some of his, um, some of his fishing. We've also been fortunate to spend some time with Ian McIntosh. I met Ian through um, the River Institute and through um, Karen Cooper um, when, I, when I started here. Ian has been fishing and hunting in the area for, I think, 70 plus years now, and he has many stories to tell. And of course, we have great, uh, you know, people love to share all the stories about the fish and, and how important they are in their lives and all the, all the great stories they have to tell about their endeavors. And, and Ian has also reflected on some of the harder times in the river. So back in the 60s, when we had legacy contaminants, um, he had a friend who was involved in legal action um, related to um, catching fish that that he sold on. He had a commercial license to sell them on and later found out they were contaminated and just the struggles that his friend had had uh, had experience to that. So, you know, there's there's some sad stories as well, but they're important to share. Um, out of that, of course, from the 60s and 70s, you've just heard from Jeff Rydell about the area of concern being declared in the 80s and then all the remediation that has been done since. So um, there's there's a lot of improvements. We look at the fish consumption guidelines now and we see improvements every year. And um, we're also trying to um, bring some information for the consumption guidelines um, for this particular project. So we've had Mackenzie give us some fish so that we can photograph them to help um, communicate, you know, how, how much fish am I able to eat from this region? Um, but yeah, the contaminant story is an, an integral part of this project as well. And so Ian, you know, brings some of those pieces of the puzzle together so that we can discuss them and remember what it was like um, when it was hard. Um, and also celebrate the achievements that you know the river has made to get um, to the state now where we can once again eat some of the fish. Um, I have friends that are divers and one of them is Corinne. She's also an underwater hockey player and she invited Stephanie and I down to Montreal for a river cleanup that was being done by divers. And when Stephanie got down to the to the wharf in Lachine, she met some fishermen there and she engaged with them, told them about the project. And in fact, also told them that we were looking to get some fish so we could take some photographs for consumption guidelines. And they did um, two weeks later call her up and say we have a we have a good sized perch that you can uh, that you can photograph. So um, they caught a sturgeon the morning she was there. Um, of course, mostly people catch and release sturgeon. And just a, just a note to say that it is legal to catch sturgeon in in Quebec. Um, and so these are some of the pictures from that morning. Um, birds, I have. Too much to say about Norm Simo, and I'm nearly um, I'm nearly out of time. We have uh, you know a selection of of bird indicators. They include bald eagles, cormorants, and osprey. Um, a bird index and species at risk. We have some scientists working on it, and we have community members that, of course, keen birders. Um, but I was lucky to meet Norm Seymour. He, um, I think many of you know, is, a, is an author. He's written Rivermen in collaboration with uh, Roy Lefebvre. Um, and I, I actually got me to meet both of them a year ago, and I've tried to keep them up to date with the project. And, and we've connected again with Norm recently, um, with Steph spending some time capturing um, pictures of Norm. Norm was much like Mackenzie when he was young. He was on the river every day. Um, he was a fisherman, he was a guide, and he went on to um, go to college and through um, do his studies, become a, uh, complete his PhD and become a professor on the East Coast. And he is a duck biologist, so as well as having lots of community stories, stories as a community member for his um, hunting and his fishing. He also is a is a biologist and a scientist and someone we'd like to draw on for working with for the indicators. Um, so just some images of, of Norm. In fact, in this picture, he's holding the egg of an osprey and osprey are one of the indicators we have for the birds. He has a, a, a bird collection, egg collection, as um, as well as some favorite decoys. He's recently downsized, so many of his decoys he no longer has, but he has kept some special ones. And, and so we, we've had a couple of uh, really nice days with Norm um, 
capturing some of his story. I'm uh, finishing off here with um, Kate Schwartz. So in the wildlife, um, of course, we have a number of indicators, um, diversity indicators. We have some threats and we also have scientists that work from within the River Institute. And um, outside of the River Institute, I, I want to give a little shout out to Josh Van Fuhren of Parks Canada, who's offered to bring in the data from um, that Parks Canada has for the indicators that are relevant for the project. Um, so thank you to Josh for that. And then um, just a brief mention, I, I have godparents up in Kingston and they're very keen on the turtles. Um, they, they're uh, part of a group called the Friends of the Kingston Inner Harbour um, and they're looking out for the turtles and the turtle habitat and doing some monitoring and volunteering there. Um, but this image here is of Kate Schwartz and um, those of you who know us at the River Institute know that Kate Schwartz came through the education program that the River Institute um, runs and is now a scientist in her own right. She should be finishing up her Bachelor of Science degree um, this year at Bishops and has worked with the River Institute for most of her summers through her degree. Um, and she's uh, another member of the community that we'd like to ca capture um, photographic uh, stories of for, for the project. So last few slides, this is just me and Ian. Um, we went out on Ian's boat. Ian has a beautiful picture of some emergent vegetation. Um, the picture is about 100 years old and so we took that picture out um, back to the site where it was taken and we took um, current day pictures. So these are the sorts of stories we'd like to share in the River Report and we thank Ian for his time and for sharing his stories. Um, I also want to thank Stephanie for all her hard work with the design and photography. It's really taken the project to a new level and we're exceptionally grateful. I know Jeff mentioned already and, and so did um, Marianne. Everyone can tell that Stephanie's made a big impact with the visuals um, that she's provided all of us to work with. So a big thank you to her. A thank you also to, of course, to the funders for the project. We'd like to do shout out for RBC Foundation um, and various other funding um, opportunities that we've had and been successful and, and a shout out to Pam Maloney for helping to bring in those funds that of course have been essential for this project. Um, we do have a subcommittee that is helping to guide the science on this project. So thank you to Andrew Morley, Jerome Marty, Michael Twist and Lee Banks, uh, Lee Will Banks who are the external people on our committee. And thank you also to all the collaborators that have stepped up um, to this point um, in helping with gathering the data and advising us. Um, we have officially five partners, so um, thank you to them. We are probably adding another two official partners in, in the near future. Um, and with that, I'm going to finish up and say to anyone who's listening from the community, um, whether you're a scientist or a community member, we're really hoping that this project can um, bring all of us into one space, have people share their stories, um, find the way that the community stories relate well to the to the science and also let the science inform some of the stories. So perhaps there's questions that people have in the community that they, you know, they're wondering about the answer to. And um, we hope that through this project, we'll be able to um, connect those dots and bring people together. So I guess with me moderating today, I get to finish up myself and say that's it for me. Um, just a couple of minutes over time and we'll start the science Q&A. Um, I see that there is at least one new question come in. So I'll just check to see if that one was for me. Um, have the question that's come in, oh, I should publish it. Have foragers ever been discouraged from eating plants due to soil contamination from legacy contaminants? And I guess I'm going to have to say I would have to ask the foragers that question myself, and that's a really great question. So I know we have some of the foragers that are online. If any of you want to put in the chat box whether you've had that experience or not, please do that. Um, otherwise, I will follow up with our foragers and find out if they have and, and um, and uh, well, you can reach out to me and then I can let you know directly. But for the greater audience, that might be a great question that we can answer in, in the River Report. 